yeah, it's different. You're going to be making almost, you know, half a million, million dollars a year. The mistakes that you are going to make, if it's not right, are going to be very expensive. Not as expensive if it was a $50,000 a year, right? Hello, and welcome to Financials Podcast, Future Rich. My name is Barbara Ginty, and I'm your host. And I'm also a CFP, which is a certified financial planner. And I am here with my guest today, Christina. Hi, Christina. Hi. Christina, I'm very excited to have you on because... I believe you were the first person on the podcast in six years with your career. Oh, yeah. Wow. I'm almost positive. Exciting. Mm-hmm. I had an expert come on who had your same career, but that was it. I have never had a guest. So would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us your age, what you do for a living, whereabouts you are, all that jazz. Okay. Um, so I'm Christina. I am a 32, almost 33 anesthesiologist in the um, in the South in the Tennessee area. I also think you're one of my first Tennessee people. Oh, it's, it's hard to keep track. Firsts. Cause we have, yeah, a lot of firsts today for me. <laughs> very nice. And then how much, about how much do you make? You know, that is a very interesting question. Okay. And I was a little embarrassed because I was trying to look up my tax return from this year. And I saw the one from last year. So my base salary is about 500,000 a year. But I, I have the ability to make more because we're short staffed and we get to mm-hmm. take more call. And I was talking to my good friend and colleague yesterday. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how much I really make. And he said, well, I made about 700. So you probably made somewhere around there. And that's we just my... take a moment and say how amazing that is? Um, yeah, it's, it's different. Um, I was a resident for many for four years and, you know, getting to this point was a long, a long long journey. Yes. So the number does kind of jump from one day to the next. And it's a little strange, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a blessing. Yeah. Well, a a hard earned blessing though. It's not like it had to go through all the work. Okay. And then you have some, you, in your submission, you said there's some changes potentially coming up, which is why you wanted to come on. Some changes in income and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I also have a, in our field and most um, physician fields, uh, including nurse um, nursing fields as well. You can do some people call it traveling. Some people call them mm-hmm. traveling assignments or um, locum tenens work. So um, that's where I generate some of my 1099 income. And I just started that at the end of last year. So that is addition to my W-2 income. So hopefully Perfect. try to tackle some debt. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about it. So we have, you have fantastic income, but it's very expensive to go to medical school. So let's talk about where we are with debt. Yes. The number is um, about $248,000. Um, you know, I was expecting it to be higher. I probably, if I were to guesstimate on average or like the lower end of average, or probably, kind of, I'm not sure, just probably about average. All right, so 248, is it all public, private, combination? Um, No, this is all um, federal. um, Federal, perfect, amazing. Yeah. Do you qualify for the public service loan forgiveness? Is the one of your, is your W-2 a qualifying institution? So currently, no. I have about four years um, just from residency in qualifying years, but, you know, there's a lot of schools of thought out there, whether... Do you pick a job with, um, mm-hmm. you know, the nonprofit status for six years? Um, I, I'm currently not in that status. Yep. Okay. Um, so my goal was going to just to be to try to tackle it ASAP. Okay. So let's run through where we are. So your income varies, but we're, we'll say around 500,000. Sure. So do you mm-hmm. have an idea about what you bring home monthly? Um, what I bring home monthly, hmm, that's another thing. I should pay a lot more attention. It's okay. You're busy. You're doing important work. But okay. I, when I get my paycheck, it kind of, I split it into two accounts. And in my Chase account, I get 4000 And in my other online banking account, I probably get anywhere from like, let's, let's just say $12,000. And that's after I've contributed that's not including like my HSA contributions and my 401k contributions. Okay. So, th- so this is what I wanted to talk about with the savings. Cause as a doctor, the tricky part is you have to, I agree with you, you want to pay off your debt, but you also want to 
save, right? For retirement. So we'll do both. So you have a 401k through your W-2 job and are you maxing that out doing the full limit of 20, this year will be 23,000? So I actually do the mega backdoor Roth. Amazing. Yeah. So I'll, okay. I usually, I max that out for, so I started working, let's see. I don't even know. I graduated residency. I got to do the math here. I'm just all over the place. That's okay. Um, but I'm a year and a half into uh, my employment. Okay. Uh, so you're so- doing, just so the listeners understand. So you're a defined, a 401, we just, I just did this on my last podcast. A 401k mm-hmm. is a defined contribution plan. The allowable dollars in that for this year, I believe is 69,000. And so then you're maxing out your employee limit, which I hope you're doing the pre-tax. And then do you have a, a match as well? We do have a match. I forget how much the match was. Um, That's okay. So you're doing your, so like for instance, for this year, for 2024, you're going to do the employee limit of 23,000. You'll have your match. And then the difference between that number and 69,000, you are putting in as a non-deductible contribution, correct? The Mm after-tax contribution, correct. Yes. And then are you immediately converting that into Roth? What do you do once it goes in? So I know I... So my 401k is a Roth 401k. And I don't know if I've immediately converted the after-tax dollars to Roth dollars, but I, be- but I believe I believe they are in a Roth account. So when you look at your statement, it says 100% Roth because the, 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 co- the, the company match almost always is not. Usually the company match is going to be pre-tax as they get a corporate deduction. Hmm. I would have mm-hmm. to double so check that. I'm going to give you a little homework. Yeah, to double, we'll double check that. And so your the your twenty three thousand, the employee contribution, the IRS limit on that one, that's going in as Roth. Correct. Okay. And then the not so then the usually their need for the after tax contribution, also known as a non qualified contribution, there normally needs to be an election to convert that to Roth. Just because your payroll for the 23,000 is Roth doesn't necessarily mean that after tax automatically goes to Roth. It would be hmm. great if it did, but usually there needs to be some sort of election for that. Well, so that's good to know. Yep. Yeah, so you just want to check that. And it depends who's who's the administrator of your plan. Who, what's the company? Uh, my the my employer. No, no, no. The um, 401k the, provider. Um, Empower. Empower. I'm just trying to know if I know that one off. I'd have to do a little digging. We do a lot of mega backdoor Roths for clients. So we know a lot of the providers. I would just have to do a little digging. They're all very different. Some of them is a phone call. Some of them are a form. Some of it's an online election. They're all very different. So I would just verify that. You can verify that. The, I call them money types, right? Because we have pre-tax, traditional 401k. We have Roth 401k. And then we have non-deductible, also known as after-tax. So you just want to check your money types on your statement. You, sh- you should be receiving your end of year statement soon if you haven't already, or you can go online and download it on Empower. And then you want to check, not always that clear on the statements. It should be somewhere on there. You can always call, but you want to verify the types of dollars to see if that non-qualified, you know, non-deductible dollar has been converted or went in after tax. Because then the issue is, right, it's not terrible. You're still putting money away. It goes in after tax. It grows tax deferred, but... It's not a Roth. Does that make sense? I see. So, mm-hmm. oh, I'm actually looking at this now. So, okay. yeah. If, so some, I have some in the in-plan Roth rollover, some in an after-tax, and then there's an employee, employer match. It's a little bit separate. Yes, because that will be pre-tax. So you have some in the in-plan conversion. Is that what you said? Correct. Okay. So an in-plan conversion is converting dollars from non-deductible to Roth, generally. Okay. And then, but you do, you do have a uh, line item that says after tax too? Yes. And there's money there? There is. Is that money invested? It is invested. Okay. Hmm. So here, okay. Do you have any outside IRAs? Like anything outside of this 401k? I do. Um, I have money in a Vanguard account. That is that a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA? So I just like two days ago converted. Um, so I'm, for 2024, I contributed the max 7,000 and then I converted that over to a Roth. Did you consult an accountant before doing that, a CPA? I did not. Uh oh. Mm-hmm. You are not eligible to do a deductible IRA. So I could, so what I did, I thought it, 
So I did um, talk to different people about it who said I could, couldn't, and I called Vanguard's. So, so you, I, did a no, you did a non-deductible contribution and then you converted it. So being putting it in a traditional. You, you put it in as a non-deductible though. So you're not going to get the write-off on it because you're not, if you have a workplace plan and you're over a certain income threshold, which you are, you're not eligible for a deductible IRA. You can do a non-deductible IRA. So you did a non-deductible IRA, which is after tax, essentially, mm-hmm. and then you converted yes. it. Yes. Okay. That should be fine. Okay. Do you have any other IRAs besides that one that you just did? Um. So what? So I started with the, since residency, I had a Roth IRA. And then okay. I recently opened the traditional IRA. Yes, those would be my only have, two. Have you heard of a, the pro rata rule? I have not. That's The a name sounds familiar, but I have no mm-hmm. idea really what it so, means. That's why I asked if you consulted a CPA because you don't want to run into the pro rata rule. It's very problematic. I don't think you did. I'm also not a CPA and I'm not licensed for tax advice. Also, this is educational. Do you have a CPA? Yes. So I just found one recently. Okay. You have to have one. (laughs) You need one. You're at a high income level and there are things that like for somebody in a lower income threshold, a non-deductible, I I hate non-deductible. Why don't we just say that? I don't think there's any reason to like tempt running into the pro rata rule or God forbid running into the pro rata rule. It's a nightmare. I There's other ways for you to increase your savings without doing that. Also, $7,000 is a drop in the bucket for your income level, right? So if that gets screwed up, that's going to be a nightmare for $7,000. That's true. Mm Mm-hmm. So return, literally return on investment, return on your time. So verify with the accountant that you didn't hit the pro rata rule. I don't think you did because it went in as non-deductible because you are not eligible for a deductible IRA. Give it your income. People don't know that, but if you are eligible for a workplace plan and you're a high income earner, you are not allowed to do a deductible IRA outside of work Um, or a Roth, right? Because Roths have very strict income limits, which are more well-known. What's really great is what you're already doing, which is the biggest bang for your buck, which is the backdoor Roth, the mega backdoor Roth. You just want to make sure that all of those non-deductible dollars are immediately being converted. And the reason they want to be, you want them immediately converted, not invested and converted is because then you would pay taxes on the gains, right? Makes it messy. With all of these strategies, you want to make them as clean as possible and stay within the rules and not have unnecessary tax or unnecessary headaches, I guess. Like the pro rata rule to me is a big headache. Sure. Does that make sense? Yes. The other item that I think is your biggest strategy, given how people in the medical field are paid, specifically what you're talking about with the travel nursing, is that you are both a 1099 and a W-2, right? Yes. Your 1099 income is eligible for a SEP IRA. Okay. So I, so again, in medical school and residency, no one talks about any of this. No, and, I know. And there's this unfortunate or very fortunate jump in income, but you don't have the jump in, in knowledge. So I scour the internet. I try to read all these things, Reddit, Bogleheads, you name it, mm-hmm. white coat investor. And then there's a lot of things that say SEP IRA versus solo 401k. Yeah, you could do... Either uh, the contribution limit for the SEP is going to be 69000 So you already have a 401k, I would do, in my opinion. And this is why you need a CPA. And just like everybody else has a specialty, you are better off, in my opinion, at your income level, focusing on your career where you're going to make 500000 700000 800000 and focusing on that and hiring somebody who's excellent at tax to tell you how to do it and make sure you stay away from things like the pro rata rule which will be a, a nightmare. The description of the pro rata rule is putting cream in coffee and then trying to take the cream out. It's impossible. Ooh. Yeah, that's exactly how to think about it. You've mixed all of your money types together and now you need to extract the cream from the coffee because you did a prohibited activity from the IRS's standpoint. Not great. No. It, also not worth your time. If you think about what you make hourly, like you don't want to be doing this. Like you should, in my opinion, hire a CPA who makes sure you maximize your retirement strategies using the vehicles that are the best and most used for you, which would be a step well over a non-deductible IRA, right? 69,000 versus seven is very different. Correct. So if I were you, I wouldn't spend your time trying to, you want to have a working knowledge so that you know you're getting the best service. But for me, 
if I were in your shoes with what you make hourly, I would not be spending my free time trying to figure this out when a CPA's license, there's a reason they went to school for that, right? That's This is their job to figure this out for you. I would hire someone who's excellent, have some working knowledge, you know that you're getting the best service. And then I would be like, maximize my tax savings here. What should I be doing? SEP or solo and hire them to do it because your best and best use and why you went to school is to do your regular job where you're making way more than a CPA, significantly more. That makes sense. Yeah. And they will help you. What I do find with doctors is because you're really smart and you're very capable, you're like, I can do this too. And you can, but you're not going to spend 40 hours a week on it. Right? That's true. So hire the person who's doing it for 40 hours a week. Their hourly rate is significantly below yours. Significantly. There's only so many hours in the day. You shouldn't be spending your weekend reading about the pro rata rule. Frankly, it's boring. I find it kind of fun. I I mean, if you like it, have working knowledge, but I would absolutely hire. Yeah. Working knowledge. But I would hire someone to help you navigate this and make sure that you're getting the biggest bang for your buck. That That's my opinion. And it's an I'm opinion. Every, obviously, everyone has one. I think you would be better served with a SEP because you could probably put more into it than the solo 401k, right? And you already have a 401k. That's fair. And then you're putting a ton of money away and then you're not messing around with these non-deductible Roth conversions which scare me. I hate non-deductible. Yeah. They're scaring me now. It's like, you find out more, you you don't know what you don't know. That's And then you're like, Oh, I didn't know that. Thought I was doing Mm -hmm. the And there's a lot of people out there, which is fine. That are great marketers for personal finance education, but they don't have the credentials, right? Sure. So that's the hard part. It's great. There's a lot of knowledge online, but it's not the textbook, right? It's not the CFP retirement textbook, which is a college class that goes through all the things that don't really make it always online, which is not everyone's eligible for a deductible IRA. People assume everyone can do an IRA. That's not true. And you're in a unique income bracket, right? Not everyone gets there. And so a lot of the material that you're going to read online is not for you, right? You're well above everybody else online. You're like the 1%. So that's not who they're catering to, right? I hear you. That's, that's what I'm running into when I'm trying to read. It's like, Oh, trying to find someone like me. Yeah. It's hard. I feel like in, in the six years I've been doing it, a female in your income, I probably had three, give or take out of like Mm -hmm. 300 podcasts. So not a lot. Right. So it's a unique situation. It's a great situation. It's just a little bit more unique. It takes a little bit higher level of planning, especially, which is the great thing is that you are running 1099 and W2, which is most, most doctors do. And it's excellent because you can use, most doctors will do a SEP to maximize that 1099 income. And I would get it so that you can maximize the full IRS limit. That would be like a strategy, in my opinion, to get enough on the 1099 that you can do the full 69,000 in the SEP. And then you can also use your Empower 401k to to also do um, the defined contribution limit there as well. And that's your mega, those are your biggest bang for your box right? You have a full pre-tax option on the SEP for the 69,000. And then I would do, if you want, I would also do the pre-tax on the other one, but it's your choice. You could do all Roth on the, except for the employer match on the 401k. So you're running both. I've been trying to sort of Roth versus not Roth, pre-tax versus post-tax. And I've, again, this is where I should probably defer to the experts, but I cannot find a clear winner on a lot of these sort of there yeah there really isn't a clear winner you're in a very high income bracket and the problem is it's a like a math equation we're missing a variable right we don't know where your income is going to be when you retire and we also don't know what those tax brackets are going to be right Mm -hmm. so i like the idea of having not not non-deductible ira but all the other money types i like right roth after tax private investments and pre-tax. If you have a co- I like, especially because you're high income earner, if you can do a little bit of all of them, I think that's a great situation to be in. Cause then you have three different tax situations. And so then you can decide which one is better for you. Cause you didn't limit yourself to one. You have all of them. So the pre-tax for you is going to save you a lot of money because you're a high income earner. Um, and that would be the step. And then on the 401k, you could focus that as your Roth. And then anything you save in addition to that could just be outside private money. So after tax money. Uh, because remember, those are three different tax situations. So the SEP IRA in the future will come out as ordinary income tax, right? It's 
goes in pre-tax, so tax deduction in the on the onset, gross tax deferred, comes out and it's taxed as ordinary income. It also has a mm-hmm. mandatory withdrawal. Um, our ages will probably be like 75. Right now it's 73, but they'll probably roll that back. Then you have the Roth that goes in. The tax break is in the future. There's no tax break when you set it up. That grows tax deferred. That comes out tax totally tax-free, which is fantastic. And then the third money type, which is after-tax money goes into a private investment account or a bank, whatever. And we'll just say investment account for the time being. That comes out. And as long as that's held for greater than 12 months in one day, that comes out as capital gains, which is one of your most favorable tax brackets, um, zero to 20%. And so that is a really great tax bracket as well. So when you get to retirement, if you have all three types, then you can choose depending on your year or what's going on in your life, where you want to pull money from based on the tax implications for each type of investment. That makes sense. Because then otherwise we don't, because we don't know what's going to happen. So in my mind, like have a, have a bit of all of it. Right. I hear you. I definitely don't want to be working until I'm 70 though. No. And you, you won't have to, not with this income, but then that way you're getting a little bit of everything. Obviously if you do all Roth, that's fantastic. But the problem is you're losing so much to tax for it to get into the Roth. So that's why I would err on the side of playing the average, you know, having a little bit in all of it. Okay. So I would get a CPA. I would talk about the SEP versus the solo for the 1099 income. I think the SEP is going to be your higher contribution limit. And then I would check on the Empower 401k and I would make sure that anything that's non-qualified is immediately converted, not invest it first, because otherwise there's a taxable event happening there. Hmm. Right. Because if you put in a thousand and it goes to 1100 and you convert it, a hundred hundred dollars is a gain. Right. And so it's not then now you owe tax on that because it was converted. It has to be, if you put in a non-deductible dollar, it has to be a dollar that's converted into the Roth, no change. So it needs to be an immediate conversion or it needs to stay in cash and then be converted. Well, I made that mistake. So that will come up. That's why you're going to need a good CPA. And some of those can be walked back and power might be able to rectify maybe, or you might just get hit with a tax bill. And then going forward, you won't do it again. Don't like the sound of a tax bill, but... Nobody does. No, yeah. at least I, at least you've been warned, right? It's the yes. worse to like file your taxes in April. And then you're like, wait, what? So if it, if the money grew and then was converted, you owe on the gain. At capital gains or no? No, ordinary income. Mm. Yeah, it won't be capital gain. I don't think so. Once again, not a CPA. Thank yeah. God. I would never want to be a CPA. <laughs> <laughs> I like the high level strategy part, you know, of like, no, obviously we study the vehicles, the pros and cons of the vehicles, right? The limitations and so forth. But ultimately the CPA has to sign off on it. I hear you. But you could go to like, now would be a good time to like talk to the CPA before it gets super busy. Obviously they're really busy tax filing and just get an idea of, you know, what the ramifications might be or if there's any way to undo it too. Sometimes things can be recharacterized is the word. Sure. So I've been talking to him, but it's been more focused on like the 1099 income side since that's new. And Mm -hmm. but we'll definitely have to figure this out. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then this is fine. This is, as you said, you don't learn this in school. I really think there should be like a personal finance class in medical school. It should be mandatory. It should be mandatory. I agree. Because this is distracting, I think. And you have a high pressure job, right? And to me, this is distracting. Like one semester of this, even like five days of this. There's a lot you could go over pretty quickly. Okay. So taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should at least be simple. That's why for the last three years, I've been drinking AG1 every day with no exceptions. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day, and it makes me feel ready to take on my day. That's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit It's also powerfully simple. With AG1, I know I'm getting essential brain, gut, and immune health support with vitamins, probiotics, and nutrients from Whole Foods. I like to think of it as my nutritional insurance. I know I'm covering my nutritional basis from the very start of the day. If there's one product I had to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1, and that's why I've partnered with them for so long. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, plus K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com forward slash future rich. That's drinkag1.com forward slash future rich. 
check it out. Those would be my recommendations for the retirement. And then what's the plan with the, how much are you planning on tackling the student loan debt? How much are you planning on? Cause we actually didn't go over like rent or anything like that. No. So I've been putting away $8,000 a month into sort of a bucket that's titled student loans. Okay. So right now that bucket has about $80,000 in it and it's just in a high yield savings account. Perfect. Um, so a part of me was just, and again, don't know what the right answer is on the fence. Like, do I invest that money? Some friends talk about real estate syndications and, or do I pay down the student loans? The student loans are about 5.75%. I get it offered to refinance at like 5.4. So it just feels like this gray area. Do I knock them out? Do I pay them down? Do you have an emergency fund as well? Not a yes and no. Okay. So this is kind of like my liquid, some of my liquid money. Um, I also have the 1099 income that I haven't touched. Okay. So, Because remember on the 1099, you're going to be paying both sides of FICA. Correct. Medicare. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. See, that's good. Because some people don't know that. And that is a shock when I say that. I'm on the fence about the student loans. I think it'd be really wonderful for you to just get rid of them. But you also want to keep something in an emergency fund. Even though you have very good income, I still believe in having one. So why, and that's the other thing, why get, so some people are very debt averse and go, oh my gosh, Mm -hmm. I just hate that it's sitting there. Okay, get rid of it. But I'm kind of, as long as I'm growing, Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't bother me, but I, I guess I would feel great if it was out of the picture too. I just don't, again, it's one of, it's the biggest yeah. rate. So the interest, so right. So what's interesting right now is we finally have good interest rates. So before when your interest rate was 5.7 on student loans, you're making zero in the bank, then obviously it made sense to pay it off. Right. Cause you were, yes. so now that you have probably, you're probably getting 5% in the bank. Mm. The hard part is you need to run both, right? We need to like have you in my, you don't have to get rid of it all right away and not save to do it. But I think there should be a plan to get rid of it unless you think you might go back and work for a nonprofit at some point, in which case you could get it forgiven in six years. Also with refinancing, the concern with refinancing is that would be a private company, correct? So you would lose the the federal Mm -hmm. protections and opportunities for different repayment programs. So I would keep it federal. That would be my advice. The federal has a lot of more flexibility than the private in terms of like different repayment programs and that forgiveness that you don't get with a private loan. I wouldn't refinance it. I'm on the yeah, fence that- about paying it off. I think maybe figuring out an amount that's comfortable and a time horizon that feels comfortable. I told myself three years, just kind of random number, two to three years. I told myself, okay, this year in 2024, I could knock out half of it and then yeah. coast the rest of it. But that's completely arbitrary. There's no science behind it. It's just mm-hmm. having a plan, which is I, I work with a a financial, I guess she would call herself a financial therapist. And she was just like, yeah, just have a plan for it. I like that you have a financial therapist, but you really need a CFP. You need- I have one. Oh, a you CFP. do. Oh, oh no, yeah. no, no. I have a I have a CPA, but I do you have a CPA. Need a CFP. Yeah, but you I, need, I do. Here's what you need. You need a team. You need somebody who's <sighs> going to be saying, I, we're, you should be doing the step. You should be doing this. It should be immediately converted. We're going to verify that it's done quarterly on a regular basis, that we're not running into any rules. Confirm it with the CPA. Make sure the filing goes well. Therapist is great, but therapist is not trained to do some of the work. That is true. Therapy is, is also true. really important. Don't get me wrong. I have a therapist, but we'll, we'll get most of it figured out today. I like the idea. If you want to do three years, that's aggressive, right? We're going to, you're going to be putting most of your, a decent amount of your free cash flow towards that. What are your living expenses? So that's also an interesting question. I may be moving to the DMV area in like July, August. Um, so yeah. right now, DC metro area? I'm yes. Saying? Okay. DC, Maryland, Virginia. Got it. Okay. So right now I gave up my apartment. I moved back in with my parents. So yeah, living expenses, I pay like 4,500 in rent. Okay. A month. 
here's what I think would be a comfortable number. I think if you got rid of your, what I was thinking ballpark is if you got rid of your debt in five years, okay, roughly 50,000 a year, give or take that way you still have, I, I still think it's always important to have an emergency fund. As you know, we never know what's going to happen. If I think you'll probably always be employed and making a good income, but it doesn't hurt to always have a little cash available for an emergency because usually when you don't have it is when we have an you know when an emergency occurs it'll still allow you the flexibility to potentially max out a SEP and still max out the full divine contribution limit doing that make it backdoor Roth and have money to live in live on and still get rid of the debt without being too aggressive if you have extra cash you don't need it that's great put it towards it but I think if you did it over a five year time horizon that will go by very quickly. You'll still be very young and you'll be completely debt-free. That does sound good. Because then at that, you're 33. So then in five years, you're 38 and you have, you know, you're under 40, you have no debt and you have, you're making a great salary. You could save a down payment in 12 months, you know, if you wanted to buy a, buy a home or whatever you want to do, right? Then the world's mm-hmm. your oyster. Yeah, it's, I guess this, I guess pot of cash a little bit. I'm in this weird stage. Like I don't have kids. I'm at the stage where I may, we're talking about engagement at this point. So thinking about cost of a wedding and Mm -hmm. all this stuff. So, but right now I am single. So I'm sort of trying to plan at the state that I am now with, with thoughts of the future, but. Right. And that's why I wouldn't go, you worked really hard to get here, right? you're in a good position. And that's why I would, I actually, if you listen to the podcast, I almost always go like, get rid of the debt, like suck it up for two years and just be done. I'm a little on the fence about that with you because your income should be consistent. And so if you give yourself a little more leeway, then you have money still, right? You're still saving money outside of this, right? Privately, you would still have money for a wedding and other expenses. So I won't feel as severe. And you can always change your mind. You could say, you know what? Now in the bank, I already made a 50,000, you know, I already paid off 50,000. I have 30,000 in the emergency fund. I did everything else. And I still have extra cash flow because I picked up another travel gig or whatever. You can always put more towards it. That's true. What I will say is you can't pull it back. (laughs) You can't say I changed my mind. I'm getting married. Yeah. Can I have 30,000 back? I shouldn't have paid that. I have a life event happening and I need 30 grand back and like savings, you know, you'd always put more towards it. You can't pull that cash back if you wanted mm-hmm. it. That's what I'm going to try to ask in power. Can we pull some of that back? Can we? <laughs> yeah. Recharacterize. Talk, talk to yeah. the CPA and then ask if there's anything that m- might need to be recharacterized. That's the term for it. I like that. But yeah. Okay. So high level, I would make a plan to pay off the student loans, but over a comfortable time horizon. So it's not sucking all of your cash. With the idea that if you end up with more in your high yield savings than you need and you don't have anything, no life event happening and you're comfortable making an additional payment, you can do that. But I wouldn't kill yourself over it. I think you worked really hard to get here. Your income is going to continue. I don't think to me there's a huge rush as long as we're doing retirement to get those all done in three years. Five years will go very quickly and you're still under 40 and you'll have no debt and you're still going to have this income potential, right? So- I would make sure we're maximizing both of the retirement plans that are available because you're W-2 and 1099. I would have an emergency fund and then I would start also continue to pay down the debt over a comfortable time horizon um, and keep extra cash in case there is a life event and you want to use it for that. That's why you worked hard to have this comfortable income. That is true. Yeah. So enjoy it. I don't say that this often as well. So... (laughs) I'm going like, save every penny. <laughs> well, that's what my financial therapist is kind of talking. She, she's like, what's the enjoyment piece? Mm-hmm. Because I told her I was flying. My boyfriend and I went to Spain and we flew like economy. And she's like, why did you do that? I was like, well, because the tickets were expensive to upgrade. She's like, but you could afford it. It's like, I don't, but I have debt. I have all these things. And so kind of talking about how do you enjoy and save and plan and pay off debt? So that's the, you know, the working conundrum. Yeah. And I think that I'm happy to hear that you did just didn't automatically splurge. Cause I think one of the biggest mistakes people make, especially coming out of medical school is the lifestyle creep. 
they immediately upgrade the lifestyle so severely that if there's any change where you have to knock it back down, nobody likes to knock their lifestyle down. I will tell you that having watched it. Increasing your lifestyle is always enjoyable. Decreasing your lifestyle, that lifestyle creep is very hard. So I actually think you're making really sound decisions, being very thoughtful about how you're going to use your income and it will get more comfortable. But I like the idea that you're not automatically inflating your lifestyle to your income because you can, but you also do have the debt you want to get rid of. In my opinion, if you can get rid of it by the time you're 40, that's ideal because then you have a number of years where you can still work and save without the debt, right? Correct. So I think the priority should be maximizing the retirement every year, right? Because you're 33. So you have, we want to make sure we get the compounding of interest effect, right? And we maximize because each year, those are the limits. You want to hit those limits because we can't go back in time, right? And say, I wish I'd saved more. So this is the most time you're going to have today, right? For the compounding, because the magic number is 7.2%, your money doubles every 10 years. We want to get you as many doubles as possible. So to me, the priority is like, let's get the retirement going since you're 33 and get as much in those vehicles as possible and utilize the tax code to our benefit. Secondary would be, I always love an emergency fund. You have to have one. That's really easy for you. You have that. And then, so really secondary is in how do we get the debt paid off in a comfortable time that allows you to still have a nice lifestyle. And in my opinion, as long as you do that by the time you're 40, I think you do by the time you're 38, you're going to be in a good position. You're already in a good position, but you'll be in a better position. That sounds good. Yeah. And thank goodness for these interest rates in the bank, because that's really helping a lot that we're like your interest rate you're earning is comparable to what you're paying. It is. It is helpful. Luckily, it's not like, luckily I'm not trying to buy a house right now because those interest rates aren't super favorable, but. They might go down a little this year. And honestly, the problem is we had those two and a half, three percent interest rates, and I don't know that we'll see those again. Getting like a six or seven is more normal, historically speaking, if you look at the historical average of mortgages. Two to three would be nice. Would be nice. I don't know if we're gonna see it again. I could yeah. be wrong, but it had never happened prior. So history we'll sometimes see. repeats itself. Yeah, we'll see. But yeah. I, I think you're I mean, you could also put down a very large down payment and not have to take a large mortgage, right? But for you, it would be nice to have the interest write-off on a mortgage, right? You'll want to have some write-offs. So, but that's for, for the future. I think your priority now is the maximizing your retirement, getting, making sure your CPA is helping you be strategic, right? They're not always good at that, which is why maybe you want to get a CFP. There are CFPs that specialize um, for doctors, to make sure that you have everything lined up right. So you could find someone who specializes in catering to your field and then just make sure that they have a working relationship with your CPA and that you have, so that therefore you have the right team around you, right? And they're coordinating and and working to your advantage. Yeah, you're in it overall a great spot. Thank you. Yeah. It's an adjustment as you can see. Yeah, and it's a learning, it's a learning curve, right? That that's the, it's almost like a lottery winner, right? You go from being a resident to all of a sudden having fantastic income and no one, no one teaches you this. And as we talked about, a lot of the material out in the media, I will tell you, it has to be generalized to be in the media. You can't do anything specific. Everything has to be watered down and very general to be not taken as advice. So what you're reading is really not catering to your situation at all. And in my opinion, some of that material is dangerous if you take it and act on it, right? Because it's not specific to you and your situation. Even in the physician specific ones, they're usually um, have to be there's have a, to be general. Yeah. Uh, and they're usually be. middle age or forties, fifties. Mm-hmm. Like so I'm in this weird little yeah. space. Like what do you do when you're thirty in your early thirties, functionally single, just getting out? Yeah, it's a great spot to be, but that's why I think you're, if you think about what you're making hourly, that's why I think you are in the position to hire the right team around you to make sure that you're making the right decisions. And those decisions are based on your specific scenario. You're right. It's something to consider. Yeah. You should think about it. Like, would you fix your car yourself? Yeah. He's like, do you want to learn? It's like, no, I don't want to learn to change my brain. You can, Um, anybody can learn it. You could read, watch YouTube and you could do it. You're smart, but it's it's not, it's not the best use of your time, you know? You're right. What do you, but what do you say to, cause a lot of the 
you know, doctor specific mm-hmm. stuff that you read. And again, I was a resident and I was targeted, you know, you get all this stuff and then you get people trying to sell you disability and insurance and correct. And then, then you get into a space and everyone says, well, fire your financial advisor. They have do it yourself. Yeah. yeah. You so can do you it. Say that, yeah. I think that'd be well, crazy at your income level to do this, unless this was your absolute passion. What I would tell you is if you were doing your job, if you tried to do medical school half time, how does it take you? Can you do it in the same amount of time or does it take you longer? Yeah. Yeah. Just longer. like anything else takes yeah. you, it would take you longer. You can learn this and you can do it. But what you need to be reading is the CFP retirement textbook, not a blog. And I don't know if I have any interest in reading any more textbooks. I've had too many. Yeah. And also like the CPA exam is a hard exam. The CFP exam was a 10 hour, two day exam, almost as much as a law degree, right? You can do it. I think at your income level, there are certain things in your life that are going to make sense to pay a professional to do for you because you're going to make more than the professional you're hiring to solve the problem for you. You're right. And that's, that's a hard pill to swallow is coming because you don't always want to spend the money on it. But at a certain point at a certain income level, a paid professional is going to solve problems for you and help you maximize where you're going to be financially. And I will say not everyone is the right professional, right? Like you don't want to get sold shitty whole life insurance just because you make a lot of money because it's probably not your best bet. I hate whole life insurance and that will make that person rich. But if you go, that's why I like the CFP, you know that that person sat for the exam, they did their due diligence, they're automatically a fiduciary if they have the CFP, we have to commit to that. They have an ethics component and we're monitored, right? So find the CFP because then you know they've met those criteria, just like you would find a CPA because you know they have the licensing and they met their criteria. And you can find CFPs that specialize in the medical profession or dentists or, you know, there's people that focus specifically on C-suite, right? Because that's a very unique position as well if you're running a company. So you could find someone and interview them and make sure it feels like a good fit. And a CFP will be transparent on how they're paid. They should be very clear with you how they get paid and what the cost is and what you get in return. I'll be doing some, some research then. Yeah. And and I think since you like this, it's not like you turn a blind eye and you turn everything over, but you're having somebody who does this as their living, right? As their career, putting together a plan for you, which you say, yes, this feels comfortable. No, I don't like it. What about this? Like it should be a team effort. It's not that you blindly turn your money over and hope it goes well. It should, they should be bringing to you ideas, right? Like now that you got this job, why don't we think about doing this differently? Or it, it's a team effort. You hired a professional to bring you professional advice and you could take it or not, but it's a team effort. So you don't want to go into it blindly. So it's important you still have a working knowledge, but you're letting them do what their specialty is. You're right. Now, if you came on the show and you were making $50,000, would you need to hire a team? No, probably not. Right? Right. But you're it's you're going to... Yeah, it's different. You're going to be making almost, you know, half a million, million dollars a year. The mistakes that you are going to make, if it's not right, are going to be very expensive. Not as expensive if it was a $50,000 a year, right? Yeah, I'm fearing that now that I... Yeah, but what you spend for, let's say you spend over the course of a year, $5,000 for a fee-based planner or $10,000 for a fee-based based planner, but they save you 30000 in taxes, well, then it pays for itself. Yeah. I think that sometimes there's some sticker shock. Yes. Think about what you're going to get from it and not necessarily the cost is what I would... Look, I pay for a very expensive CPA. I'm a business owner. It's expensive. There's a lot of things that I pay for that are expensive, but I also have to look at the flip side. If I don't pay for it and I do it myself and it gets screwed up, what will that cost me? You should think... I I would would think of yourself... Yeah. I would think of yourself as a million dollar business. And if you were a business owner, you would be hiring a team. You'd have to, because your day job is making the million dollars, right? Yes. Mind the business that pays you. <laughs> yeah. So that's the way so, I would think about yourself as a business. Just like I, I have a business, right? We make over a million dollars a year and I have a team because I'm not going to make a hundred thousand dollar mistake. That would hurt. <laughs> it would hurt. And it might not happen right? It's very possible it doesn't happen, but there is the possibility when you're, when the numbers get bigger, the mistakes get bigger. It's just, it doesn't matter whether you're a business or an individual, mm-hmm. you, but I would think of yourself as a business. You went to school, you did all of this training to make this income. Treat it as such, treat it as a business. 
you are the business. You can contract yourself out at 1099. You can choose to be W-2. You have a lot of flexibility um, and a lot of earning potential. But to make money, you have to spend money. And you spent a lot on your education. And so I would spend some on making sure that you get that full return on that that income every year. Well, I'm going to start doing my research. You make... Yeah, I, I would say... Yeah, I think it's hard to think about it that way. But if you think about it, only 2% of uh, female-owned businesses in our country break seven figures. That's it. An entire country of small businesses, right? We have a lot of small businesses in America. You are going to do that as an individual person. Think about that. Only 2%. I I've never yeah. heard that statistic. That's only, pretty... And that's of businesses, business. not even on just income. A, an entire business, only 2% of female-owned businesses in our country break seven figures in rep gross revenue. There's a lot of expenses with running a business. If you think of yourself as a business, you're pretty lean. You need a CPA and I would highly recommend a CFP. And that's it. It's a lean business, if you think about it. And you have $250,000 mm -hmm. of debt, which can probably be paid off in five years. If you think about yourself as a business, very lean. For a restaurant to make a million dollars, think about how much overhead they have. Well, yeah. So you might have to spend a little money, but it should pay in, in leaps and bounds, making sure you have the right disability coverage. At some point, you might need life insurance, making sure you buy the right sized house with the right size mortgage. You're saving enough in retirement. Your tax strategy is spot on, right? It's more than the investments that you're pay you'd be paying for. It's all of those components, and those are where the big mistakes happen. And the mental relief, the... Yeah, that you don't have to, you can go enjoy your day off. You have a high pressure job. That is valid. That is valid. I think that's the, I think that is the mental shift. I would think of yourself as a business. Your earning potential is probably close to a million dollars a year, depending on how you work it out. Because you just got started. Yeah, uh, that's good. I, I haven't thought of it in that way to think of. Yeah. Technically, I think of a part of my, myself as a business because my 1099 income dictate, yeah, dictate it is it yeah i would think of you as the business yeah holistically yeah. you invested in this right this career path but it's a demanding job and high pressure um so i would outsource that and you would have any business owner outsources right you should be working on your highest best use what's the maximum and your maximum value is doing what you trained for and i do enjoy it I do. So that's great. And then the, because my post call days and whatnot, I, I am trying to read the stuff and, you know, I'm running into dead ends a lot of the mm -hmm. time. So you're right. It would, I can still read for pleasure, but then yes. to make sure someone's. Yeah. And then forward it to your CFP and be like, how does this affect me? I read this article. Is this something that's relevant or isn't relevant? You know, then you have another person to work with, right. Who does this for their profession. It's, it's a team. Also, also it's just so hard to find good people. It is very hard. And and that is that is why I really push the CFP. And not to say, you know, there's bad eggs everywhere. I do think that if you're going to take the time to go through the program, it weeds a lot of people out because it's pretty rigorous. And I will say that I just we're posting this today. This the statistics just came out. Almost 24% of the CFPs nationally are women. So if you wanted a woman, you're more likely rather than just an advisor, if you're looking under the CFP arena, there's more women. Women tend to be good planners, right? So it just feels like women, rather than just the investments, gravitate towards the CFP designation because the statistics are higher than just a, an advisor. And you can interview them and you can always get rid of someone. If you hire someone, you don't like them, you just get rid of them. You just say, this isn't working for me. It's not permanent. Because mm -hmm. even with my accountant now, it's like, I don't, and again, like you said, Maybe I'm relying on him too much to do planning when that's technically not, not his role. Not his role. Yeah, they can yeah. give you some strategy, but they're not going to tie this all together with a neat little bow. It should really be your CFP. And then the CFP says, here's my idea for retirement. I want to do this. I want to do that. Let's get the approval from the accountant, see if they have any suggestions or tweaks. Because remember, the accountant is seeing you uh, at tax time, right? There is nothing that can be done for the prior year. Tax year ends on December 31st. The planning needed to be done like September, October, November. And you don't talk to your accountant then. You talk to them after the tax year has ended. I think that's the problem. I was trying to talk to him September, October, November, like, mm -hmm. help, what should I do? 
thinking that, yeah. that and that's not really his job. No, and they can, some of them can do, it's just, it's a different mindset, right? Yes. I haven't, I, what I will tell you is with all the accountants I've worked with who are great, it usually all of this ideas and strategies of like, for instance, you have 1099. Should you be using a section 179 vehicle and writing that off? If you're traveling to the hospital. That's probably a very valid deduction that could save you, I don't know, $60,000 in one tax year. I've never had an accountant suggest that. I've made the suggestion to see if the accountant would approve it, right? But so something like that could see, like, think about that. So you hire a team, right? And let's say it's expensive. You spend $15,000 a year on your CPA, CFP, but you save 80000 More than pays for it, doesn't it? It does. Mm -hmm. You could have a brand new car and it could be completely tax-free. Got to get over that sticker shock. Yeah. Think about what you're not saving currently. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely probably thousands of dollars. I think tens of thousands. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but like you can be I know like, it. yeah. I mean, like, so for instance, with the 1099 income, I would look at a section 179 vehicle, something that meets the weight requirement. You're driving to the hospital, you're traveling. Maybe you drive to the travel station for whatever the term is. But the, these are things I would want the accountant, the CFP to suggest and the accountant to approve. And know he but, didn't mention that. And because I drive my little Honda Accord. I was just going to say, you're probably driving a Honda Civic. I was just <laughs> going to guess that. And you probably could be driving like a brand new Range Rover that's com was completely tax-free or 80% deductible. And now we're talking about the G-Wagon. Yeah, or your G-Wagon. On the Jets. But, yeah, but the, the thing is, if you don't, if it's a tax break and you have a high year and you hit seven fifty, you sit down with the account and say, "Okay, maybe I need to hide one hundred and fifty thousand. I'll go get a G wagon and reduce my taxable income." Think about that, and you're spending fifteen thousand then in that scenario to save one hundred and fifty thousand on your taxes. Think about that. The hardest thing when you think of yourself as a business owner is you really do need to spend money to make money. No business opens a restaurant and then doesn't put a sign outside because it was expensive or doesn't get the refrigerator because it's expensive. You have to invest to make those businesses work, right? Takes money to make money. It does. It does. And you've already spent a ton of money, right? Think about what you invested into this career. Money and time. And you can't get that back. So mm -hmm. have to make the best decisions moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. And you will. So this is wonderful. This is a really fun podcast. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me. This was really, I've learned a lot and I've got some more digging to do. And I'm going to think of myself as a business for sure that. Think of yourself as a business and think about with businesses you have to spend, you don't want to spend frivolously. Like you don't want to hire somebody who's a jerk and not going to help, but intentional investment in yourself going forward to make sure you're maximizing this, I think is important. I've got it. Thank you right. so much. Yes. Will you stay in touch with us and keep us posted? We'll do. Absolutely. All right. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Time for our disclaimer. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance references are historical and do not guarantee future results. Make sure that you consult with your own legal, tax, and or financial advisor before making any decisions.